Good morning. Good morning. It is great to see all of you this morning. It is a great day to come together, to be together, and to worship God together. And we are so pleased that we are all together today. It is good to be together. This morning, there are a few announcements that I want to make. I'm going to go ahead and get my, my uh, paper out here. The first thing I want to mention is that our breakfast before church has been moved from September the 24th to October the 8th. October the 8th. And that change will be noted in our worship bulletin this next, this next Sunday. And so... The new date for this is on October the 8th. That kind of segues into why we're doing this. That is because if you look also at announcements in your worship bulletin, we are celebrating the, the ministry of Pam Haynes, our administrator for the last 20 years. We are doing that on the 24th. And so we did not want to have too much during that day because there is going to be a reception following that service on the 24th for Pam. Let me also mention that if you have cards or letters that you would like for Pam to have that expresses your appreciation or whatever it is that you feel about Pam, and Pam is just a wonderful person, we all know that. But anyhow, if you would get those cards and letters into us, I know the church office uh, can receive those, but Barbara Blackburn is being our point person on much of this because we're trying to, we're trying to surprise Pam in some way, some ways. She knows the 24th is going to happen. And quite honestly, she gave us a bit of trouble about that, okay? But it was good trouble. She's a little bit embarrassed by it, but you know what? You do, you do the right thing. Pamela, Pam deserves anything we would do for her. If you would also look at your, at your announcements, I want you to highlight and circle on your calendar September the 10th. After worship service, we are going to have our annual salad potluck Sunday. And so that is on the 10th of September, and that will be after worship that day. I'm looking here to see if there's anything else happening. The one thing I want to mention to you, because you always look forward to this, is that Jim Rollins, Reverend Dr. Jim Rollins, will be preaching this coming Sunday. I will be away. Uh, I will be on vacation. It's probably going to be a staycation. But Mary Nell and I are going to play some golf. We're going to hang out together. And who knows what we're going to do? We may take a day trip or so. But Jim is going to be our preacher for this coming Sunday, our worship leader. We all know what a great job uh, Jim does. And so... We look forward to that. The last thing I want to mention today is that many of you were there yesterday. We celebrated the 80th birthday of Beth Crawley, and it was a wonderful time. I have, I have never seen a birthday celebration as extensive and well planned out as that one. I think she is recovering today uh, <laughs> from all the family that came in, and so we, uh, we do celebrate her birthday. And, uh, and so the uh, other thing I wanted to mention to you, uh, speaking of birthdays, is that a special friend of the church who wore a pink cowboy hat today is having her 96th birthday. And it's Jean Clemens. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Gene, happy birthday, kiddo. We're so glad you're here with us and thriving, which you do very well. Folks, that's all the announcements I believe we have for today. Um, would you bow your heads, please, for the opening prayer? Oh God, we greet you and worship you this day as the maker of all that is and as the lover and caretaker of our souls. 
Forgive us when we have not thought of you or moved our hearts toward you. And help us in this hour to find our way back to who we really are in you and to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As you are able, would you please stand for the call to worship? We gather as the body of Christ. We are many individuals, but together we are one. Each of us has our own gifts, our own calling, our own role. But all of us proclaim Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Let us worship God together. to God saying have mercy on us we call to God saying Lord help us we call to God even in the midst of our sin knowing that God is gracious and just let us now pray the prayer of confession printed in our worship bulletin followed by a time of silent meditation let us pray almighty God when faced with earthly powers that seem overwhelming we crumble. We fear this world. We fear losing our status, our stability, our station more than we fear you. Forgive our shortcomings and teach us to trust in you when we take risk 
for what we know is right. If God was not on our side, we could not stand in the judgment. But God is with us, steadfast and faithful, as we seek to live in peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. seated. Blessed, let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first scripture today is Psalm 46. In your pew Bible, you can turn to 517, page 517 of the Old Testament. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. This is the word of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
Our scripture lesson today comes from the book of John, chapter 5, verses 1 through 18. It is located in the New Testament on page 96 of your pew Bible if you wish to follow along. Listen now for the voice of God in Holy Scripture. After this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool called in Hebrew Beth Zetha, which has five porticos. In these lay many invalids blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, stand up, take your mat, and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. Now that day was a Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been cured, it is a Sabbath, it is not lawful for you to carry your mat. But he answered them, the man who made me well said to me, Take up your mat and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take it up and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had disappeared in the crowd that was there. Later Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Do not sin anymore, so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Therefore, the Jews started persecuting Jesus because he was doing such things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is still working, and I also am working. For this reason, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but also calling God his own father thereby making himself equal to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is never simple. It is never easy for one person to help another person. Let me explain what I mean. I used to have a romanticized idea of how to help people. All my life I heard stories of dramatic changes that came into other people's lives because they had received help. And these stories made a great, great impression on me. The old cliche of leaving the world a better place was a literal vision for me. Now this was my hope as a young man. But then as I began to try to help, I ran head on into reality. My coming of age happened this way in the story I'm about to tell you. As a young man, I taught Sunday school near a downtown or at a downtown church in Houston. It was right outside of downtown. And this church was surrounded by a slum. One Sunday, a little boy by the name of Junior Craig, dirty, unkept, and smelly, showed up for my class. I was intent on helping this child. Early in the week, I went to the address he had given and found a good example of urban squalor. It turned out that Junior's father was in prison and the family was living on public welfare. I told Junior's mother that I was his Sunday school teacher, and she said to me, 
he has no business going to that church. He doesn't have the kind of clothes you need to go there. Now, I was quietly determined that clothes should not cut off a little boy from coming to Sunday school. And so later that week, with his mother's permission, I took Junior to Sears and I bought him the clothes he needed to look like all the other boys in the Sunday school class. The clothes were obviously the first new clothes Junior had ever had. And when I dropped him off at his house, he said to me cheerfully, see you in church. The next Sunday, Junior Craig did not show up. I was genu genuinely concerned and I went to his house. And there I found that one of the many dogs they had was chewing on one of the shoes that I had just bought Junior the past week. I had a hard time getting Mrs. Craig to come to the door. She was not only evasive about where Junior was, but also about his new clothes. I went back to their home three or four times trying to help, but finally I gave up in exasperation. When I shared what had happened with Junior Craig at church, one of the members said offhandedly to me, you know, I wish you had talked with me before you did all that. I know the Craigs. They're no good. They are third generation welfare. There is nothing you can do for people like that. Any effort that you put into them is wasted. Now this was a crushing blow to my idealism. I had tried to help, but it had come to this. I felt like throwing up my hands and saying, well, to heck with this, there's no way to help them. This is what I was honestly thinking. And unless I am badly, badly mistaken, this is where we still are as a nation with our public welfare system. The politics of compassion have been an issue for many, many years. It has been roughly 90 years since Roosevelt's New Deal. And for those of you who may need a bit of a refresher here, the New Deal tried to solve social ills through government. And I don't know anyone, quite honestly, who is really pleased with the results we've seen. What started in 1932 as an emergency method of keeping people from starving has grown into an unhealthy dependence among a segment of our population. C.S. Lewis said something important here. I want to make sure you get this. He said something very, very important. He says that when you begin to think of medicine as food, when you begin to think of medicine as food, you are headed for trouble. Medicine is what you take to get over sickness. It is not meant to be food. Yet this, as, yet this is what has happened over the last nine decades with our welfare system. Instead of emergency relief, welfare for some has become a way of life, and this really is in no one's best interest. Now, you won't be surprised to hear this. I mean, my background is my family was greatly helped by the New Deal. Mary Nell's family was also my wife's family. Here is an example of something starting out to achieve one purpose, but, but has lots of unintended side effects. And so what on earth do we do at this point? The idea that it is simple and easy to help people in lasting ways has been changed forever. Naivete is dead. What is to keep us from giving up? 
Now, Jesus himself confronted this issue of entrenched poverty and helplessness. It's in the story I just told you. I think this is part of what the story is about. A man had been lying helplessly beside the pool of Bethsaida for 38 years. The pool had become a gathering place for those who were looking for healing. Tradition said that when the waters bubbled up, an angel had stirred them, and the first person in would be healed. Now, you know as well as I do that the power of the mind is is powerful in terms of power of the mind over the body is powerful. If you really believe something, it has power. And so this man spent 38 years trying to get into that pool, only to have someone else beat him every time. Now, Jesus had come to Jerusalem for a Jewish festival. But instead of going to the temple, he chose to go to the place where the need was greatest. The first thing he said to this man was this, do you want to be healed? Jesus did not assume here that every sick person wanted to be healed. Think about it with me for a moment here. Think about it with me. Sickness has its disadvantages, but it also has its benefits as well. By staying helpless, this man did not have to get up and go to work every morning. His illness, I believe, was a way of attracting attention and getting people to do things for him. At least part of that illness was. I think we could all recognize that there are certain advantages of sickness over health. And I believe that Jesus knew this. If the willingness to be healed is not there, then there is no amount of effort that is going to make a difference. Jesus was exactly right when he began with the question, do you want to be healed? Now, was this the first time anyone had asked this? Explain this to man, explain this to the man by the pool? I don't know. But what I do sense here is something deeper within this man shifted. The part of him that didn't want to change was touched. And then Jesus did something very crucial in helping him. He gave the man some of his own strength to do what he could not have done by himself. Jesus lifted the man by his feet and convinced him he could be different. And it happened. Energy flooded through his limbs that had been inactive. This man was able to pick up his pallet and carry his own weight. The kind of thing we all want to see come from our trying to help others really did happen here. A man who was wasting away in dependency was now a functioning person. Folks, for helping to be healthy, there are two ingredients that are always necessary. First, there is the willingness of the person in need to do something about the problem. You have to be willing. And secondly, people who are willing to make some of their resources available to those who need help. Sometimes you actually have to have help. Now, if either of these two ingredients are not there, what I believe is going to happen is lasting change will be either impossible or short-lived at best. Our challenge then is to find a way to understand how we can help in a more realistic way. And so the question, do you want to be healed, must be raised or the sense of being dependent will rule everything. At the same time, though, when someone really does want help, then we must 
give them that help. The strong simply cannot turn away from the weak or even greater damage will take place. To illustrate my point, Thomas Carlyle tells a story about an Irish tenant farmer who died and left a widow with three little children. This was, the, this was the day before Social Security. The man who owned the farm needed to get someone in there who could work the land. And so the poor widow and her three children were thrown out of her house with no money to take care of the children. She went to the nearest town and began to go door to door explaining what had happened and offering to do any work to provide for her children. Person after person turned her away, saying, I have problems of my own. Please go away, or go away. And so after four days of no food and sleeping outdoors, the youngest child's body was weakened, and she woke up with a burning fever. By noon of that day, all the children were sick. And by that evening, this family was the center of an epidemic of diphtheria that spread to the whole town. Only at that point did it become clear that this woman's situation was also a problem for the larger community. Their community's failure to deal with the problem meant they had to deal with it later on in a worst form. Folks, helping someone is not a simple task. The example of Jesus by the pool at Bethsaida can help us now if we will let it. Jesus asked the right question here. Do you want to be healed? But then he did the right thing also. May God grant us realism about helping people. And out of that realism, may we experience courage and hope. Amen. Our affirmation of faith is printed in our bulletin. Let us stand now and say what we believe. Since we have been delivered from our misery by grace through Christ, without any merit of our own, why then should we do good works? Because, because Christ, Christ, having redeemed us by his blood, is, is also restoring us by his spirit into his image, image. So, so that with our whole lives, we must show that we are thankful to God for his benefits, so that he may be praised through us, so that we may be assured of our faith by its fruits, and so that by our godly living, our neighbors may be won over to Christ. Amen.
please be seated. At this, at this time during our worship service, every Sunday we do this because we think it is important that we invite people to express their faith and to join this church. And so if you are interested in making a profession of faith or knowing more about becoming a Christian, or if you are interested in looking at church membership with us here at First Presbyterian, I would ask you to see me after this worship service today. We know that God gives and gives and gives and gives. And in return, let us now bring a part of what we have for this community and for our world. Let us pray. We pause, O oh God, to think seriously of what we do at this point in worship. We are bringing our gifts to you who has given us everything, including the life of your only begotten Son. It is an awesome thing to do. Let our spirits praise you in this expression of our love. Amen. Please be seated.
Let us pray. O oh God, so much of our lives is about insurance, trying to insure our future. And yet our souls are perishing for the lack of attention. Teach us how to care for the things that are the most valuable, the hearts and minds of those around us, the good earth you have given us, and our relationship to you. Help us to live in communion with you. Let holiness and not ownership be our goal in life. Show us your will for this church and let us follow it, becoming missionaries of love and renewal and wholeness in our community. Heal the dividedness and brokenness in our lives. Take away our anger and our resentment. Make us feel good about life and therefore good about ourselves. Lead us into gentleness and contemplation and faithfulness and generosity. Reveal through us your power to change lives. And let us learn to praise you as the giver of all mercy, O Lord, our strength and our salvation. And now let us pray together the prayer Jesus taught us, praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
now may God be with us wherever we go. May God make the sunshine in our souls. May God use us to touch the lives of others, blessing the poor in spirit and easing the ills of this world. And may God's name be praised now and forever, time without end. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.